I want to see that man in jail. I want to see him spend the last little bits of his life uh, with no freedom. Lucille has had her life stolen by that man. What's wrong with our law system when somebody admits to killing somebody and they can uh, still walk free? Ah, disgusting. The story we're about to tell could be one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in Australian criminal history. What is this, some kind of conspiracy? Did one man get away with murder? You meant to tell me that you have gone 40 plus years to sit me here. Why didn't you do it in 1970? Wish we had, Jeffrey. Wish we had. Leaving a family's faith shaken to the core. He's just confessed. You've got to do something about it. I can categorically prove he's a liar but I cannot prove him to be a murderer. For investigative crime reporter Adam Shan, this case is personal. We're doing this story in order to right a wrong. With your help, we can bring a killer to justice. You'll be a, a, a hero, an absolute hero to me. I came across the story of poor Lucille Butterworth about two years ago. That was after the Tasmanian coroner declared it was likely that she was strangled to death and her body disposed of on the banks of the Derwent River. If the coroner's to be believed, and there's no reason why we shouldn't believe him, her killer has gotten away scot-free. We're doing this story in order to right a wrong, to finally bring her killer to justice. I've lived and breathed this story for a very long time, and it's time to share it with you. Most people, after they talk with her just for a minute or two, they liked her. Yeah, it was just, she just had that attitude. Uh, radiant, you know. Had a little um, playhouse up the back that was actually the old truck house, <laughs> and it was all cleaned out and made it nice. And um, she'd, you know, want me to go up and have cups of tea, you know, it was good. Yeah, it was fun. When Lucille finished school, she started modelling and took a job at the TV station in Hobart. She had an orangey coloured uniform. That was the, the office uniform. Uh, and the coat, that black coat with the white. She modelled that coat and she walked around. And then she came over to where I was sitting and she said, I love this mum, can I have it? I said, yes. You can have it. Lucille fell in love with a young man by the name of John Fitzgerald. He lived in the town of New Norfolk, a half hour's drive northwest of Hobart. She used to go out there and stay with him often. On the day she went missing, Lucille was making the journey to stay overnight with John after attending a Miss Tasmania fundraiser. She planned to drive there in her little Austin A40. My father thought that it was too dangerous driving up that dark, lonely road, uh, but it was for her safety, for her care. <laughs> Parents, that's what they do. So she took the bus. Yeah. And, well, we know what happened after that. Mm. Lucille got a lift to this spot in Claremont, where there used to be a bus stop. In 1969, all the buses to New Norfolk had to stop here. But on August 25, police believed there was a problem. The bus she wanted to catch was late. She thought she'd missed it. A car pulled up and she accepted a ride. And that was the last time anyone saw Lucille Butterworth. I was the one that took the phone call on the Tuesday morning from John Fitz. 
Um, I was probably ready to go to school. Not probably, I know I was. I was in my school uniform because I used to walk to school. What did John Fitzgerald say? Is Lucille there? Quote, unquote. And I said no. So I just called out to Mummy, I think you better come here and have a chat to John Fitz. And I think she might have said something like, well, no, well, she's supposed to be up with you. And I'd assume John said, well, no, he's, she didn't come up last night. And that was when Mum sort of started to collapse, so I grabbed hold of her. Otherwise, she'd have ended up on the floor. And I think I might have said something like, it'll be all right, Mum, you know, we'll be right, we'll, we'll find her. The Butterworths immediately reported Lucille's disappearance. What do you recall the police did in those early days? Nothing. So this was just so out of character for her? Absolutely out of character. And the general consensus in the police force was that she was a runaway. Lucille wouldn't do a thing like that. She, she you know, she loved us all. Her family knew Lucille would not have run away. She had a good job. She was in love, and she'd only taken enough clothes for an overnight stay. Something awful had happened to Lucille, and it came to her father in a terrifying dream. He said he woke up one night, he was choking. Um, and th there was a white light. A red one outside the window. He said to me, quote, Lucille has been murdered. That's what he said. Crucial investigating time had been lost, but the message finally got out. Well, this is where the trail of Lucille's known movements ends. What happened from here on, no one knows. Oh, I'm nearly out of my mind. I feel as though. I've had a limb torn away from me. It's a terrible feeling. The police soon turned their attention to New Norfolk, the town where Lucille was headed. They formed a view about a former policeman turned taxi driver, John Gannon Lonigan. He had a history of picking up women in bus stops and sexually assaulting them. The chief investigating officer, Inspector Orb Canning, was so convinced that Lonigan had murdered Lucille, he refused to investigate any other leads. Canning was, he, he was fixated with Lonigan. There was no doubt about that. Well, for one thing, Lucy wouldn't have got in the car with him because she didn't know him. Why didn't Inspector Canning have enough understanding of Lucille to realise that they needed to find other suspects. Canning's tunnel vision proved disastrous. The case against Lonigan stalled when police investigators were unable to place the rapist near the Claremont bus stop where Lucia went missing on August 25. Lonigan was a prime suspect, but nothing happened. What toll did that take on your parents? Ah, uh, well, well, it, it, it took a huge toll on both mum and dad. Uh, Dad, I'm sure Dad died of a broken heart. Um, and having a daughter of my own, I can understand that now. And for Mum, uh, she didn't want to leave the house that we were in um, because she thought Lucy was going to walk up the driveway. When Lucille's parents died, they left instructions for their ashes to be scattered in a rose garden across the road from the bus stop in Claremont. They lived in hope until the very end. Someone may talk and we'll have something to put it to rest. A little bit of peace, peace of mind, instead of the wondering. For 41 years, nothing had been achieved by the police. Then Detective Inspector David Plumpton arrived at the Glenorchy CIB. In the 60s and 70s, most everybody was aware of Lucille Butterworth, the missing person. Why did you take it on? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Because you could. That's the difference. People say things because it mattered. I don't know, does that make sense? 
because it mattered. But what made it really matter was when I meet Jimmy Butterworth and John Butterworth. Oh, the face of someone who's suffering from that immense personal loss. And you've got control over something that can help them or maybe lessen the pain. So it becomes a bit of a focus for me at Glenorchy CIB. So having a look at the file in 2010, yep. what conclusion could you draw from the file? That Lonigan was the number one person of interest and more than likely the offender. But there was another name mm -hmm. in the file. Yep. Just a mention, what was that name? <sighs> Jeffrey Charles Hunt. Next, police finally make a breakthrough. We got him into the police vehicle and uh, he was quite uh, calm and uh, without, without hesitation he confessed. When Detective Plumpton dusted off the file on the disappearance of Lucille Butterworth, he found an unfamiliar name. Jeffrey Charles Hunt. Jeffrey Charles Hunt had murdered a lady by the name of Susan Knight, car saleswoman, in 1976. Miss Knight's body was found yesterday afternoon by police acting on public information. It was found buried underneath a pile of heavy logs, some light timber and some rocks. He had, using a false name, arranged for her to bring a car, a Volkswagen, to Dromedary where they meet. He takes her into the bush and uh, rapes and batters her to death and just leaves her there. He's caught, interviewed, admits it all. The man arrived at the spot where Miss Knight's body was found about 30 metres away. He walked into the thick bush with two detectives and two police photographers. July 7, 1976. Uh, yes. The murder of a young car saleswoman, Susan Knight. Can you remember the circumstances of that call out? Yes, I can, yeah. It was horrific, really. She had horrendous injuries and she was uh, uh, naked and she had a nasty wound to the head, obviously bashed to death with a stone. After the body was discovered up at Mount Dromedary, a person that knew Hunt had seen his vehicle being driven in the general area of where the used car was found abandoned. And uh, as a result of that, we decided that uh, he was a person of interest and we would uh, pick him up and interview him in relation to it. The man accompanied detectives back to the car and drove off towards Hobart. We put him into the police vehicle and uh, he was quite uh, calm and uh, without, without hesitation he confessed to murdering the girl Knight. In the vehicle, you told me. In the vehicle on the way to the Ranoi police station, yes. So you get there and the formal interview begins? Yeah, we get there and we do the formal interview, uh, which was in the form of a um, typewritten record of an interview. And that was done by me in the presence of uh, Detective Dillon. Remember, this is 1976. Police didn't use videos and computers. It was all typed or handwritten. Barry Dillon had worked on Lucille's disappearance seven years prior, and something in Geoffrey Charles Hunt took him back to 1969. So he asked Hunt, could he help with Lucille as well? And what happened next was extraordinary. At the conclusion of the uh, interview, he said, yes, I know all about that. And he went on to say that, uh, uh, he'd uh, picked her up from the bus stop. He knew her, of course. So uh, she accepted the lift and uh, on the way to uh, New Norfolk, on the other side of a place called, known as the Lime Kilns, he stopped the car in you know, a cutting further past the uh, Lime Kilns. And uh, when he stopped the car, something came over him. That was the words he used. And uh, he grabbed her and tried to kiss her and she struggled. Next thing he knew, he said he, hands around, he had her hands, his hands around her throat, strangling her. In fact, he said he did strangle her and, and she died. He said, and then he got out of the car and uh, put her in a fireman's lift, carried her out there some distance towards the Derwent River and um, dumped, her, dumped the body there. This is without us questioning. He just freely said this straight off. Did he explain to you why he was telling you this? No, he didn't. Uh, I think when it was put to him, it seemed to me that he was just so relieved to get it off his chest. 
That's the impression that I got. O'Gary and Dylan had Hunt confessing to the murder of Lucille Butterworth. They were related, and so they should have been. They still needed their boss to sign off on the confession. So who did they call? Detective Inspector Orb Canning, who'd been in charge of the original investigation back in 1969. Canning, who'd been fixated on John Gannon Lonigan and refused to let go even when he couldn't charge Lonigan. And now he was still fixated on Lonigan when he had Hunt's confession. This was about to set in train one of the great failures of justice in Australian criminal history. Detective Inspector Canning, uh, he went into the interview room and he was in there quite some time, I'm not sure how long, and, and uh, I said, well, what's, what is going on? You know, why is he in there so long? And uh, shortly after he came out and he said, you've got it all wrong, he's not talking about uh, uh, Butterworth, because I told him that, you know, he'd, he'd confessed and he said, uh, you've got it all wrong, that's not what he's saying now. And uh, with that, Detective Dillon said, I'll go back in. He went back in to see him. And he, Dillon came back out and he said, well, he's still saying the same as he told us. So Canning went back in again to uh, do another interview. And this was completely against uh, proper practices. And he came out to me and he said, he's unable to assist. And when I had to fill the interrogation register out and detail what he said, and I, and I put that down because he said he didn't want any complications. So the confession was never recorded and would have gone unnoticed to this day if it weren't for Detective Plumpton, who met with O'Gary and Dillon in 2010. And that is when they say to me, Hunt confessed. What? Oh. So Hunt's confessed, but he hasn't confessed. The only contemporaneous note of that occasion is that Registrar of Persons interview signed by Hunt saying, been spoken to in relation to Lucille Butterworth, but is unable to assist. No confession. Where is there a confession here? Would it be fair to say over the years, this confession assumed the proportions of an open secret within Tasmania Police that a lot of people knew about? Absolutely, absolutely. Word travels fast in the police, you know, on the grapevine or whatever, it travels very fast. And, and there was a lot of people, the detectives, a lot of people would know about the confession. One of the most remarkable aspects about Hunt's confession that night was that there were five more detectives outside the interrogation room when it was made. When O'Gary and Dylan came out and told Canning about the confession, they all heard it. Yet for nearly 40 years, no one said a single word. There were five of them. Why didn't they all go in there and say, oh, hang on, Orb, you know, you can't go doing this. He's just confessed. You've got to do something about it. Oh, what is this, some kind of conspiracy? My mother and father died because of the stupidity of the police. Next, Plumpton rebuilds the case against Hunt, brick by brick. We've got Hunt driving a family car that a witness describes as being present and stopping at the bus stop. Once Plumpton discovered the botched confession from 1976, he needed to prove that Hunt killed Lucille Butterworth. So much time had passed. Her body had never been found and Hunt was back in the community. He'd been released from jail after serving 24 years for the murder of Suzanne Knight. Plumpton convinced the Tasmanian coroner to hold an inquest into Lucille's disappearance, but he needed a brief of evidence. I'm in Station Street, New Norfolk. This was one of the key locations of David Plumpton's investigation, because it was here that Lucille was headed to the night she disappeared. Her boyfriend, John Fitzgerald, lived here on top of the general store. It's a residence now, but back in 1969, it was a store that John ran with his father. But who else lived in this street just down the road? That would be Bill and Mavis Hunt and their six kids. What set the family apart was that five of the six children, including Geoffrey, were albinos. In a small country town, 
they really stood out. Have you fellas are ready? Right. How tough do you think it might have been for those hunt children growing up in a place like New Norfolk? I think Jenny probably copped the worst of it, um, being female. The most of the others are pretty well accepted. What about Jeffrey? Always strange. He was just passing him in the street. You'd feel uncomfortable initially, and then if you got close to him, you, the hair on the back of your neck would go up. You just didn't feel safe around him. At that time, Jeffrey Hunt was working in the Fitzgerald store. He would be stocking shelves or working at the back. You'd see him driving the delivery van between the two stores. And yet later he denied completely working there. No, he's definitely there. Hunt would also deny that he knew Lucille. Didn't know her. Lived at nearly opposite. Perved on her over the fence. She was sunbreaking on uh, the Fitzgerald's uh, lawn. And she got up and went inside and told John, oh, Whitey's been looking at me. And uh, John said, oh, don't call him Whitey. He doesn't like that, you know. So, hmm. It mattered to police that Geoffrey Hunt knew Lucille. It gave her a reason to accept a lift from him at the bus stop in Claremont, albeit reluctantly. Police had another very good reason to investigate Hunt back in 1969. It was well known in New Norfolk that, as a 16-year-old, Geoffrey Hunt had been accused of molesting a girl at the train station. Correct. You know, you heard your parents talk or relatives talking about it, and as far as I understood, it was true. But why wasn't he taken off to boys home or anything like that? I think he had, or uh, well, his father had friends who protected him, or protected the family. Plumpton's team had a lot of work to do around this bus stop here in Claremont. They had to prove that Geoffrey Charles Hunt could have driven past here on his way home about the same time as Lucille Butterworth disappeared. If they could do that, they could put a strong circumstantial case before the coroner. And Detective Carrie Milhouse, a key member of Plumpton's team, did just that. He is meticulously going after bits and pieces, pulling things back from the 1960s, the 1970s, highlighting things. And all of a sudden, we've got Hunt driving a car. We've got Hunt driving a family car in and out of work. We've got Hunt driving a car that a witness describes as being present and stopping at the bus stop. No one had this in the past, but we now have. So we're not relying on an apparent confession. We've now got Geoffrey Charles Hunt, known murderer, driving by, stopping at the bus stop. Lucille Butterworth there prior to this car stopping. Lucille Butterworth not there after the car leaves. With this new information, Plumpton and his team believed they had all the evidence they needed. So in 2014, they made their move. So we arrested him on suspicion of murder, brought him into the Devonport Police Station, where we conducted a lengthy interview and put everything to him. Next, we've obtained exclusive access to the police interview with Geoffrey Charles Hunt. I've never met her, I've never seen her, and I don't know. AM. 45 years after Lucille Butterworth vanished, detectives Plumpton and Milhouse sat down to formally interview their chief suspect. Mr Hunt, could you please give us your full name, age and date of birth? Geoffrey Charles Hunt, born on... What you see in this police interview is a torturous process unfolding. It's a marathon. Goes for more than four hours. Depending on the question, Hunt will either answer truthfully, lie, be evasive, or go off on long, rambling monologues. Plumpton and Milhouse set out to establish a pattern of lies. And a good place to start is the Fitzgerald's shop and residence in Station Street, New Norfolk. Now, John Fitzgerald, you know John Fitzgerald? I do know, I think, but you never saw him much. People have told me, Jeff, that you actually worked at the Fitzgerald store. I'm afraid you're wrong. Well, I'm not wrong, they're wrong. 
Lucy Butterworth, you know who she is? Only what you read in the media over the years. Well, are you saying you didn't know her? I don't know, I don't, didn't know her. Do you recall looking over the Fitzgerald's back fence on a beautiful sunny day, Lucy was there sunbathing? Never done it before. I'm not about what you're talking about. Well, she passed that information on to Joan, Joan Butterworth, her sister-in-law. Did she? Well, she said that man that I call Whitey, oh, yeah. he was looking at me over the fence. It made her go inside. I do not know the lady, never set eyes on the lady. Oh, she knew you well enough to get into the car with you. I'm afraid that you're wrong, she never got um, When this lady disappeared, um, where'd she go missing from Claremont? First here, Claremont. Is yeah. this the area here, the Claremont bus stop that you drove home past every night? I didn't drive home in that area. I used to catch the bus until 71. That's when I bought my, bought my first car. Hunt's story was that he was on the bus that day in August 1969. He said he didn't get his driver's licence until December of that year. But the police knew that was a lie. Where did you get your driver's licence? At Norfolk. And who took you for your licence? I got kicked out of a bloody police force. John... John Woodhouse? Yeah, that was him. Right, and for your information, Jeff, he left the police department in 1967. Did he? Hmm. No. I got my license for all, for all, all of a sudden motors in 66, but I wasn't old enough for a license in 67. No, his name was John. I'm pretty sure it was later than that he left. You've confirmed it was Woodhouse. You've already said that he was the man that... I know, um, hang on, I know his name, as I said, I knew his name was John. It might have been Johnny Young. He was about killed in the chainsaw wreck. Keep your balance there, Jeff, because you're pedaling backwards very quickly. I just can't remember. No, his first name was John. Hunt's rightly sensed here that the cops have boxed him in. It didn't take him long to change his story about when he got his driver's licence. Right, that was April 12, 1969. So you were driving by that time, agreed? Mm -hmm. Not December 69, as alleged. Well, I just said, twice. I'll have to change that for 68. December 68, yeah. All right, I'll show you a picture now. Do you recognise that, a vehicle like that? Yeah. What's that vehicle? That's a 61 FB Holden. Okay. Do you recognise the colouring on it? Is that a blue roof or white roof? That's a white roof? No, it was one I had was two-tone blue. Light blue and this to dark blue fins. Now, the car that Millhouse has shown Hunt is very similar to the family car that Geoffrey's father bought back in the 60s. Hunt Senior didn't drive, so Geoffrey was the only one who drove this car. The witness across the road from the bus stop in Claremont reported that the car he saw that stopped and picked up Lucille was a beaten-up old Holden, just like this one. What the police had to prove now was that Geoffrey was driving that car on 25th of August 1969. Well, this is a continuation of an interview with uh, Geoffrey Charles Hunt at the Devonport Police Station. Where we finished off, Geoffrey, we were talking about the FB. August 25, 1969, you drove past the Claremont bus stop. No, I never. Three days after Lucy went missing, or two days after there was publicity in the paper, missing girl, Lucy Butterworth, have you seen her, blah, blah, blah. Malcolm Bond said to you, Jeff, you drive past that way. Did you see her? And you said, no, nah, didn't see her. Jeff, Malcolm remembers it, remembers it clearly. You've got a good memory. Yes, Why can't he have a good memory? You people seem to have a bit of confusion here. We've got people who will put you there, your vehicle there. All we want from you is the honesty about that. Look, I'm being honest with you, Inspector. I know nothing about this lady no, no, who disappeared, no. how many years ago or whatever it was. I've never met her, I've never seen her, and I don't know her. Malcolm Bond says, I saw him driving the FB at times, and pretty sure he parked it up near Melville Street where I did. Halfway through the interview, I think he realised that you weren't putting Absolutely. evidence on the table that was going to convict him. Absolutely. And there became, wasn't. His attitude changed. How did it change? He's far more confident. And he became oh, assertive. Uh, yeah. Did you pick up Lucille Butterworth? No. On the 25th of August 1969? No. Did you drive her to a park on the Hobart Road towards New Norfolk where you sexually assaulted and murdered her? Did no. you do that? No. We went there to obtain a confession from Mr Hunt. We didn't obtain that confession. Now, you've got bloody evidence to say that I'm involved with the disappearance of this lady. You present it now and let's go with it. Come on. Because you're not going to admit it, are you? I'm admitting nothing at all. If we'd have been good enough, we'd have got a confession. At the end of the day, let's be clear. Oh, I can't put up. 
uh, all these um, excuses. There is no excuse. You meant to tell me that you've gone 40 plus years to sit me here for a couple of hours asking those bloody questions. Why didn't you do it in the past? Well, I was at prison for 26 years. You never come anywhere near me between when the lady first disappeared until I was sentenced into the prison in 1970. Wish we had, Geoffrey. Wish we had. Well, Wish we had been done. That is not, but that's not our fault. I can categorically prove he's a liar, but I cannot prove him to be a murderer. The time now is 12 minutes past three. Really? Jeez. I will conclude the interview. We dropped him back at home, and we came back to Hobart. We still haven't found Lucille Butterworth, and he hasn't been charged with murder. Next. There are new hopes of a breakthrough in one of Tasmania's oldest suspected murder cases. Police are set to find the remains of Lucille Butterworth. Despite an epic four-hour interview, the police had failed to extract a murder confession from Hunt. They didn't have a body either, so they ordered a dig. There are new hopes of a breakthrough in one of Tasmania's oldest suspected murder cases. Police are set to start digging up an area north of Hobart in an attempt to find the remains of Lucille Butterworth. So, David, why did you come and dig here? At this location you're about at now, that road is not where the road is of the day. The lay-by has changed, but we determine this is the location that Hunt strangled Lucille took a body from a car parked here out into the bush and dumped a body. So we dug it up, obviously. We had here forensic experts who are internationally and nationally recognised for their skills in this type of thing. We had assistance of the University of Tasmania in putting probes in, looking for um, something metallic, uh, teeth, or the remains of somebody. And when they first start finding bones in this area, you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we found a lot of bones, animal bones. Having said all of that, though, we obviously didn't find anything to indicate that Hunt was telling the truth or that Lucille was, in actual fact, here. In your heart of hearts, though, yep. did you think you were going to find something here? Yeah, absolutely. It was a big disappointment. <sighs> One of the issues, of course, is where yep. the water is uh -huh. here. Yeah. And the critics yep. say, well, he must have put her in the river. Yes. And we all speculate and guess about the fact, oh, he's a local. Where would he have gone as a yep. local to do this? If it had been premeditated and he thought, right, I'm going to pick this girl up or he's decided I'm going to murder her, he would have gone to a far more secluded spot. But he's not looking to hide. All he wants to do maybe is to kiss her. And so he hasn't chosen a spot out of the view of everybody. He's chosen a spot where he thinks he can do something. The end result has been an absolute unmitigated tragedy. There was no body and the clock was ticking. The coroner's inquest was coming up fast. But then Inspector Plumpton received a phone call from an inmate who served time with Hunt in Risden Prison. So I'll speak to him. What? Hunt's confessed to him. Shortly thereafter, two other prisoners come forward and say Hunt confessed. The interesting thing is, these three prisoners didn't know one another and they were in jail with Hunt at the time. One of those inmates, Philip Roger Harris, spoke to Adam for his podcast about an encounter with Hunt in prison. There was a bloke that you knew as Hunt. Do you remember when you first saw him? Yeah, so uh, albino, white hair with pink eyes and rolling around his head all the bloody time. So I said to him, what are you in for? I already knew, and he said, uh, murder. And he got talking about murder and this and that. And the next day, he told me about uh, Lucille Butterworth that uh, he murdered before. And I said, when do you come up on that? And he said, well, I don't. They haven't found the body yet. Yeah. 
he told me that he knew her and blah, 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 and known her for a while. And he said he picked her up and we was going back home to New Norfolk and she uh, got panicky and wanted to get out of the car. So we stopped the car and he reached over and strangled her. And then he, he pulled her out of the car and he was bloody, he said there was mud, God, truth. He said I couldn't drag her any further. He said the mud was over me bloody boots. He said, so I just left her there. And I thought to myself, well, it must be near the river somewhere. That's what I mm. thought. I asked him, would he ever do it again? He said, yeah, sure. He said, I loved it. Did you think about telling the police what Hunt had told you? No, because I just thought he was bloody like me, you know, just big noting himself like everyone does in jail. You only believe half the bullshit they tell you. He's a very clever man, don't get me wrong. He's, I tell you what, he's got astronomical brain, that man, but uh, he's psycho. The inquest into the 1969 disappearance of model Lucille Butterworth began in Hobart today. I'm full of confidence because Mr Hunt is not only going to have to give evidence, but he's going to have to answer the questions. Very rarely does that happen. Geoffrey Charles Hunt has made his first appearance at the Lucille Butterworth inquest. Isn't it time that you told them what happened? You're sitting in the court there. Yep. And you see Hunt in the witness box. Can you describe your feelings? Hmm. I'd have shot him. Sorry, I probably shouldn't say that. I'm not a violent person, but... Yeah, it was, it was pretty hard. And how did you regard the evidence he was giving? Um, okay, do you want to politically correct? No, I'd rather the truth. The truth? It was lies. He lied. He could describe in intimate detail the number five cylinder on the FB Holden that didn't work. But as soon as Simon Nicholson said, but you knew Lucille, have a look at that photo there, you knew Lucille. No, I did not know that lady. That's just about a quote of his words. And during the course of that inquest, we had to listen to witnesses who were autonomous to one another, but were um, in prison at one stage with Hunt. And one of them had said, this is Hunt saying, you know, pick up a Sheila at the bus stop and, and then to dispose of the body, um, you cut them open and put a brick in it and they sink in the water. So we had to sit there and listen to that. It was too much for Miss Butterworth's fiancé, John Fitzgerald, who was wheeled out of the courtroom sobbing. I just hope in the next couple of days something comes up out of this. We, we, we deserve to know what happened to Lucille. Lucille Butterworth's family waited almost 50 years, but it took Coroner Simon Cooper less than 10 minutes to deliver his finding that Geoffrey Charles Hunt had killed her. The coroner accepted Hunt's confession of 1976 almost word for word. That being, he picked her up at the bus stop, stopped the car on the way to New Norfolk, strangled her, and then disposed of her body on the banks of the river somewhere near here. It was a stunning finding of guilt. But that didn't mean he'd be charged and sent for trial automatically. That decision rested with Tasmania's Director of Public Prosecutions. It would be an anxious wait for John and Jim Butterworth. The Tasmanian coroner found that Geoffrey Charles Hunt killed Lucille Butterworth in 1969. But the decision as to whether he would be prosecuted, that rested with the DPP. Haven't you lied about this time and time again? You're a killer. At that point, were you confident there would be a prosecution? Yes, absolutely. And then the Director of Public Prosecutions calls you in for a meeting. Yes. What did he say to you? Oh, when he first walked in the room, I think he was a little uh, nervous. Because I think he knew what he was 
the news that he was going to tell us was not the news that we wanted. There were tears this morning as Tasmania's Director of Public Prosecutions broke the news to Lucille Butterworth's family that Hunt would not be criminally charged over her suspected murder. How do we feel? Devastated. Mr Coates said, I have also concluded on the relevant and admissible evidence there is no reasonable prospect of convicting anybody with Miss Butterworth's death. How much evidence do you need? How much does our law in Australia need to hear things like this to be able to act? Can't believe it. I do not believe that this sort of thing can happen now. And you lost uh, faith in the system, Jimmy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't it time that you told them what happened? As it stands now, everyone thinks he's guilty. You begin to realise, no, this is, this is an injustice. It's not justice. We want him brought to justice. We want him put behind bars. That's what we want for Lucille. You've done hundreds, probably thousands of interviews with, with suspects over the years. Do you have any doubt in your mind that he's the killer? Absolutely none at all. You walk past the bus stop most mornings with your little dog? Yeah, every morning I go that way, yeah. It does come back every now and again, you know, and I discuss it with Dylan and we say, what if, what if? And uh, he always says if it hadn't been for that canning, he said we'd have cleaned this up and, and uh, put the girl to rest, you know, and the family would have had some closure. At the moment, there are two memorials that Jimmy's put up, one at Claremont near the bus stop and one out where her remains, we believe, were disposed of. Is that enough? No. I'm too close to this story now, I'll admit that. I want a result for Jimmy and the family who've been tortured by Lucille's disappearance. And time is running out. Uh, you're now 82 years of age. You've just got a pretty devastating diagnosis of your cancer. It's terminal, yeah. Uh, six to 15 months or something will... That depends, this is what the doctors say. Do you fear that due to the incompetence, the arrogance, the technicalities, that you may not get an answer while you're still living? Well, it's very possible. Very possible now that, now that we've had that sort of answer, you know, from, from uh, the DPP. Lucille Butterworth is dead, and her alleged killer, Geoffrey Charles Hunt, still lives in the small town in northwest Tasmania. I can't name that town for legal reasons. But I reckon he'd be the loneliest man in this state, and it's hard to argue that he doesn't deserve to be so. When I was making my podcast, I decided I needed to see him, to understand what his life was like. So I staked out his house, I followed him around for the best part of a day, and I took this photograph of him. I must say it was unnerving to be in his presence. And I'm not the only one to seek him out in his hometown. You worried everybody, Jimmy. I know, but <clears throat> I only went to have a look. I photographed the house with its sheets off a bed hanging its curtains and couldn't see him, but I pulled the car forward a little to see the side windows and the curtains moved and then slowed down and didn't move anymore. And so I assumed that he did see me. What would you have done if he'd come out? Well, Adam, I'll ask you, what would you do? What would you think? I know what I'd want to do. Right. But I'm not you, so I can't answer for you. Well, the better part of that was I drove away. I've been reporting crime now for about two decades and I can't think of a more obvious miscarriage of justice. 
I sought an interview with David Plumpton's successor at Glenorchy Police Station, and the police media unit told me there's no active investigation into Lucille Butterworth's murder. If anybody in New Norfolk has anything that they've seen, heard, or anything that's coming from hearsay, please come forward, tell what you know. It's not going to hurt you. Nobody's going to hurt you. You'll be, you'll be a, a, a hero, an absolute hero to me and to those that were around Lucille.